Hello. This is my first piece of long form content since my thesis defense. So if you're familiar with my work from there, let me tell you a little bit about what I've been doing since then. Pufferlib is a reinforcement learning library that takes a lot of the insights that I made during my PhD and attempts to apply them more generally to reinforcement learning. So the compatibility, being able to work with more complex and interesting environments, uh, the speed for being able to simulate a bunch of these in parallel, a bunch of convenience utilities, and a whole bunch of systems hygiene for the field as a whole. Just Pufferlib in a nutshell. So what I'm going to do today, this is going to be a longer, pretty rambly video. I'm just going to go through the Pufferlib white paper, which is on archive. There's been a little bit of drama around the reviews on this uh, that admittedly I stirred up. I'm going to talk about this, and since I've graduated now, I can speak a bit more openly, and I can give my thoughts towards the end of this on uh, the sort of the real state of academia and the state of peer review and what I see as a, a big problem in caring more about form over substance. I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, before I get started here, a couple quick things. So I will have a another long form video coming out soon. It's going to be much more highly produced, much better edited, and it's really going to outline my thoughts on not just Pufferlib, but its place in the field as a whole and where I see reinforcement learning going. So look out for that one. I just have to edit it. It'll be out fairly soon. Uh, but for today, Pufferlib is right here, pufferai.github.io. We have docs online. You can click that link to get to the GitHub. It's all free and open source. And it's been getting a ton of support. I'm really appreciative for it. Um, the little acceleration. This right here is when I started working on Puffer full time after graduating. Uh, it's already past Neural MMO as my most widely used project. And I'm really, really happy to see where this is going. I've been building it live on stream. And uh, you can drop by that. There'll be details in the description and afterwards. But uh, if you'd like to support my work, please go ahead and start the repository. It helps me out a bunch. Now let's talk about the paper. I'm going to read through this. I'm going to give an opinionated read through. Um, the paper didn't review well, and it was mostly, in, at least in this last cycle, uh, about the way in which I presented things being too opinionated or subjective. So of course I thought I'd make an even more opinionated and more subjective version of that just so you can sort of see where I'm going with the field. And I think that you'll find that the language is actually quite reasonable. And uh, I'm not just making crazy claims in here. They're all backed. And in fact, most of the things that I'm leaving out are just gory technical details that you probably wouldn't want to read in the first place. But let's get started here. You have an environment, a model, and a reinforcement learning library that are designed to work together but don't. Pufferlib makes them play nice. This library provides one-line environment wrappers that eliminate common compatibility problems and fast vectorization to accelerate training. With Pufferlib, you can use familiar libraries like CleanRL and SB3 to scale from classic benchmarks like Atari and ProcGen to complex simulators like NetHack and Neural MMO. We release PIP packages and pre-built images with dependencies for dozens of environments. All our code is free and open source software under the MIT license, complete with baselines, documentation, and support at pufferai.github.io. So right off the bat, this I'll give you this as an example, and then I won't harp on it too much for the duration. But like the couple first sentences at the start, these kind of rub some people the wrong way. Uh, that work together but don't, that designed to work together but don't, Pufferlib makes them play nice. It's just a tagline, right? I talk about the things that I mean by that below. I'll make statements like this. It's a tagline. It's meant to give you some memorable things about Pufferlib. It's kind of promotionally, but like it's all free and open source software at the end of the day. I'm building these tools for academia to use for free. So, I mean, you got to give me a bit of credit and a little bit of leeway there, right? I would at least have hoped so. Continued progress in reinforcement learning requires training on increasingly sophisticated environments. Nearly all of modern RL tooling was written with Atari in mind, arcade games with flat image observations, discrete 
actions, and a single agent. As a result, many of the most interesting environments are incompatible with standard tools. These oversimplifications have led to a more pernicious implicit assumptions as well that make interesting environments even less practical to work with. For example, by assuming that each environment instance will run at roughly the same speed as others, environments with deeply branching logic become too slow to use, and dependency management is so poor that even installing environments can be a hassle. So what I'm doing here is I'm setting the narrative, right? I'm setting the scene for the state of reinforcement learning. And I provide evidence for a lot of these things throughout the paper, but also a lot of it is just meant to resonate with reinforcement learning researchers, right? If you actually are doing work in the field and you're not like some senior that never has to write any code, uh, then this was your daily experience, right? Like I'm speaking your language. That's the idea at least. Pufferlib solves all of these problems. The key insight that started this project is that it is possible to wrap environments to look like Atari from the perspective of learning libraries without any loss of generality. This means that we can use all the standard tools exactly as they are with nearly any environment. We then built high performance vectorization for distributed simulation, bindings for dozens of popular environments, and additional tools for developers. Our main contributions are, and notice how concrete these are, one-line wrappers that make complex environments like NetHack, NeuralMMO, Gridly, etc. compatible with any reinforcement learning library that supports the standard gymnasium and petting zoo formats. Drop-in vectorization for simulating environments in parallel. Most environments will see at least a 30% speed boost and 50% to 3x with pooling. This is a broadly compatible contribution applicable to nearly all game environments. It's more than game environments actually by this point. And then three open source demos uh, with bindings for a dozen plus common environments. The entire training stack for the most complex environment is less than 2,000 lines of code. These are our concrete contributions. So I set the narrative and then I give you the very specific things that I'm going to show you uh, Pufferlib does. And perhaps I may disagree with academia here, but if I'm able to show you these three things, this is a huge transformative thing for the field. Right? Being able to scale to more interesting environments, being able to make all of your experiments faster, and being able to just conveniently work with environments that before now have just had so many systems and dependency issues and things. Right? Again, if you work in reinforcement learning, this is your daily experience. Right? These are the things that you fight with instead of actually being able to think about the research problems that you care about. The system architecture shown in figure one, will be next page. Unlike most heavy RL frameworks, Pufferlib provides a lightweight set of tools that simply improve performance and compatibility with other RL libraries. Pufferlib integrates with all common environment formats. So it's very difficult to quantify the simplicity of a library. Uh, my usual response to this is just literally, these are all open source. Go open Pufferlib source code, go open sample factory source code, SB3 source code maybe, and just see which of them you think is heavier, more frameworky, harder to learn, right? Gym and Gymnasium, these libraries define the APIs for the vast majority of environments used in research and provide associated tools such as the spaces module for defining data shapes and vector for vectorization. There's some historical stuff I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, but one thing I wanna clarify for a lot of researchers is uh, they'll look at what Pufferlib does and say, oh, I thought that Gym and Gymnasium do that. They don't do that, right? Gym and Gymnasium just give you this API with all these spaces. It has vectorization technically, but it's very slow, as you'll see. It's not really compatible with all the different environments you're interested in. Uh, as you put more complex environments into it, it gets even slower. If you try to put something multi-agent into it, it'll often just crash. It's not a multi-agent API, and the multi-agent wrappers for it don't really work. It has very, very bad error checking and handling. So when you're trying to do something interesting, you spend hours debugging because you just get random weird error messages out of it. Uh, things will work serially like on the local serial vectorization mode and then they'll crash in parallel these are like the types of rl just horror stories that you hear constantly and that's your daily experience as a researcher so yeah no gym and gymnasium don't solve everything on their own pufferlib exists because they don't right important piece of historical context OpenAI originally published Jim in 2016, and nearly all non-DeepMind environments from 2016 to 2022 used it. 
Maintenance was taken over by an independent open source group in 2021, but since they didn't have full control of the repository required for maintenance, they forked it in gym as Gymnasium in 2022. So when we say Pufferlib supports Gym and Gymnasium, note that this involves a non-trivial chain of dependency management and compatibility patches that would normally fall to the user. Uh, you can read the setup.py file if you want for Puffer, I go through all the different gymnasium versions and half of them are like, this one's broken, this one throws weird errors, this one has a ton of weird deprecation warnings, you know, this one requires an old version of setup tools. Oh, this one's kind of stable. So that's the one that we use. And then we have like overrides for specific environments that require way old versions or way new versions or whatever. I'll actually scroll. Yeah, right to here so you can see the figure. And so Petting Zoo, multi-agent analog to Gym and Gymnasium, even though it was developed independently, uh, Petting Zoo API followed the Gym and Gymnasium schism and has similar versioning and dependency issues as a result. Pufferlib handles these as well. So now let me look at the figure that was mentioned before. And admittedly, this is not an amazing figure. I think it's a decent enough figure, right? Not a graphic designer and not at a stage of my life where I'm spending a week on a figure anymore is actually a thing that happens uh, in DC, in uh, doctoral research, by the way, when you have PhD students who are not graphic designers being subjected to a high quality standard for graphics. Um, but anyways, it should do a decent enough job, right? The Puffer architecture runs multiple different vector environments, and uh, each of these can have different copies of the environment hosted on them. There's the vectorization process shown where you get observations uh, out of your environment and it shows you all the processing steps that happen on the observations as they come out of the environment and the actions go back into the environment and it shows you all the steps that happen to the actions to get them onto the individual environments right from this big block of vectorized environments and then the emulation layer which is going to be covered in more detail but i alluded to at the start is making all the environments uh, seem like simple environments so that they're easier to work with this involves flattening and unflattening data essentially and we'll get to that later but this is sort of put there at the start as a, just an overview of the puffer architecture and something nice to look at there's also dmn which is uh, deepmind's counterpart to gem uh, both provide comparable apis there's no real reason to use one over the other but most modern research is standardized on gymnasium pufferlib converts to the gymnasium api by default for this reason DeepMind is, um, I think that they didn't like do as much open sourcing and community stuff early on. So this just API didn't get chosen. They also have a lot of turn-based M's which cause some other infrastructure problems. Uh, you can handle these now with Puffer, but for a while they were difficult. So not super relevant. We have support for it, but not many people using. Pufferlib is not another SB3 or CleanRL because it is not a learning library. It's not a claim I'm making that needs to be defended. This is simply a statement of the design, right? It includes one first party PPO implementation, which is itself adapted from CleanRL. And even that only exists for specific testing purposes. Instead, Pufferlib makes all the existing libraries work the way they are supposed to. Reviewers did not like that line. To those, let me finish first. To those outside of RL, this may seem like an incredibly low bar, but fighting with basic infrastructures for weeks is a nearly universal experience among RL researchers and practitioners. We include a list of related libraries that may include some utilities, though they primarily target learning itself. So saying makes libraries work the way that they are supposed to, I can expand that and give you an excruciating amount of technical detail, right? Um, I didn't think it's relevant. It's a little quippy the way I wrote it, sure. But like, I do give later in the paper, I show all the places that they fall short, right? You don't necessarily get the defense to it immediately, but if you take the paper in context, you'll see. Um, so the deal is that these environments, they say, yeah, you they work with gymnasium or petting zoo environments, right? But then the thing is they actually only support a small subset of these environments. Uh, that like a small subset of the gym and petting zoo API and then maybe they have some tools for dealing with the larger set of it But those are very poorly tested. So like they'll error out or they'll be really slow, right? Or they'll have huge memory overhead So when I say works the way that they're supposed to and this is part of the design of the emulation layer of Pufferlib Basically what happens is that 
when you wrap an environment with pufferlib, it will only trigger the simplest, best tested code paths of SB3, uh, CleanRL, uh, CleanRL is pretty simple, right? But, uh, you know, Tansho, whatever you're going to use with it, it'll only trigger the best tested, simplest parts of that. And you'll see that in the design later. So this is kind of quippy, but it is really true. And if you take the paper in context, you'll see that, right? I have the list of libraries here. And it's hard to quantify, like, when I'm telling you what a library is, right? Like, I, I this is going to be a subjective evaluation. And I say that there, it's a subjective evaluation of their relative strengths and weaknesses. I just put this as background lit. It's not even super relevant because Puffer itself isn't a learning library. I just said, like, you know, this one's relatively simple but slow. This one's more complex but fast. I said that sort of thing, right? Whatever. And then I say here that I don't talk about control, robotics, or GPU accelerated uh, libraries and tools because Puffer is mostly for CPU. I actually do have a one GPU demo now, um, but I give a little bit of justification for that. Running environments on GPU enables massively faster training at the price of constraining the types of environments that can be used for research. As a result, we consider these parallel areas of tooling, each of which is unlikely to replace the other, right? So in order to have a GPU environment, you have to write an environment to run solely on the GPU, which is really hard. And like GPUs are not magically faster than CPUs, right? They're highly parallel. They're really bad at uh, really dense branching logic where the environments are all doing something different. So you're not gonna just write everything on the GPU. In summary, Pufferlib sands the rough edges off of environment and learning libraries to sit in the middle. Jim Gymnasium and DeepMind Env define how data enters and exits the environment, and then Pufferlib formats the data in a way that learning libraries expect and provides performance improvements along the way. Again, sands the rough edges off. They don't like these like little quippy things, um, but this is a three sentence summary that tells you, you as a researcher who are interested in doing research on more complex and interesting environments, making your research run faster, uh, wasting less of your time on compatibility and dependency issues. This tells you roughly what Pufferlib does and how it helps you accomplish that, right? It's a little summary section. This is not where you put a whole bunch of technical jargon. The rest of the paper, uh, for the most part, is written in this problem solution format. It's meant to be very easy to just use as a reference because again, even though I am being high level in some places, there is a lot of technical detail in other places, uh, a lot of like description of exactly how we do things. And if you're a researcher, you're not gonna necessarily care about all the details, you're gonna be caring more about what it can do for you. So what I tried to do here, which I think is generally quite good practice, but the reviewers seem to disagree, um, is I wrote these as problem solution with topic sentences. So if you're just skimming a paper, right, you're gonna read like the first sentence of whatever uh, of each section. So if you just read the first sentence after problem and the first sentence after solution, you'll get the high level picture of why Puffer exists and what it's trying to do, even if you're not gonna get the details immediately, right? The details come afterwards, the statements are not justified by what comes before, but they are justi justified by what comes after. Puffer tank. Problem. Setting up a development environment for RL is difficult and time consuming. Extensive system package dependencies, slow source builds, and versioning obstacles prevent otherwise useful environments from attaining broader adoption. I could name a bunch of these. I generally chose not to pick on specific environments here. I could give you the list, but I'm choosing not to pick on environments when it's really not necessarily their fault as much as it is the broader ecosystem of RL, right? Solution. Puffer Tank is a Docker container with everything you need set up correctly and tricky versioning issues handled. Current version has CUDA 12.1, PyTorch 2.4, Python 3.11, dependencies for dozens of environments, and convenience development features such as a rendering pass-through for WSL. Um, so I think you'd have to be very uncharitable, as the reviewers were, uh, in order to say that this is like too wishy-washy. I tell you exactly what's on the Docker one sentence after I say everything that you need. We're aware that containerized development is not ubiquitous in AI. And I explain this one very carefully because I understand that like not everybody wants to be, have everything shifted into Docker. Uh, thoroughly, we thoroughly considered lighter weight options like a Conda environment. Unfortunately, 
The dependencies for many environments take hours to build and contain a mix of system and Python packages. Our pre-built images allow you to get up and running in minutes and to reset to the base installation instantly if anything goes wrong. How many of you have broken your CUDA drivers before, right? Instant reset, full environment, uh, full development environment, back up and running. That's what we provide. Most IDEs, include VS code, including VS Code, have plugins for seamless development in both local and remote containers. For minimalists, NeoVim with SuperVaven code completion is pre-installed. Okay, that's my own thing, right? But maybe some people will use it. Note that you can use PufferLib without PufferTank. So I'm not forcing you to use a Docker container. I'm providing it as an option. PufferLib itself is a PyPy package, pip install PufferLib. PufferTank exists because specific common environments have tricky dependencies, not PufferLib itself. So basically, I didn't make a mess of the dependencies in making PufferLib, right? The mess isn't mine. The mess is these environments that you want to work with. So if you want to work with these environments, I'm making it more convenient for you by making sure that they're built correctly and maintaining these images, right? They're, the problem I'm solving here is not a puffer problem. I'm not solving my own problem. I'm not introducing overhead, right? I'm not shipping something that's so complicated it has to be distributed in a Docker. I'm shipping it in a Docker because RL has these problems to begin with. Section 3, 3.1, emulation. Problem. Learning libraries make strong assumptions that are incompatible with cognitively interesting and efficient environments. This is partly a historical problem and partly an engineering limitation. Most learning libraries were designed with Atari in mind, which is single agent with flat tensor or image observations and single discrete actions. The most interesting environments usually do not adhere to these constraints. For example, NetHack is rendered in ASCII with additional information contained in a panel at the bottom of the console. There's no sensible way to represent this information as a flat tensor. So the NetHack learning environment is forced to expose it as a dictionary of arrays with different shapes and also different data types, by the way, as well. Even when flat representations are possible, they're not always optimal. For instance, Neural MMO provides isometric rendering, but the training API instead exposes local state data for each of a variable number of agents because it's a thousand times faster than rendering, which enables users to train on a desktop instead of a supercomputer. Solution? Pufferlib provides one-line wrappers to make simple learning libraries work with complex environments. It does so by flattening observations to tensors and actions to a single multi-discrete variable. This means that from the perspective of the learning library, the environment looks like Atari, thereby emulating a simpler environment. I want to say that one more time. This is the crux of Puffer, right? This means that from the perspective of the learning library, the environment looks like Atari, thereby emulating a simpler environment. That's the key piece of Puffer. Pufferlib provides a function to undo this operation, which you can call in the first line of your model's forward pass. This means that there is no loss of generality. So we have this one line wrapper that this is what I mean by makes them play nice, makes libraries work as they're intended, right? Like flatten everything, doesn't matter how complex your environment is, doesn't matter what your simulator is, now it looks like Atari. So if you have a library that works with Atari, it's gonna work with your really fancy environment. That is the insight with Puffer. Now that's not necessarily clear to researchers that do all their research on Atari and maybe are thinking about getting into something more complex, right? That's gonna be something clearer to anybody who's tried to work with a fancier environment. So I give you a little bit of example. Normally to use an environment like NetHack, you would first have to write a single purpose environment wrapper to do something similar to what Pufferlib does more generally. Since this requires packing and unpacking arbitrary data, it is an error prone operation that is difficult to test. Pufferlib does all this for you with an efficient implementation tested against dozens of real and mocked environments. So instead of you having to manually mash all your data together uh, to do this, to make your environment work with whatever your vectorization is, um, by the way, that's still not going to be enough with multi-agent. We have additional tools for that. But instead of uh, you having to mash all your data and then unmash your data and like mess up the byte order or something weird, right, or mess up a data type, Puffer does it for you. And if it doesn't work, you can yell at us, but it should work. Because we have lots of tests, right? We test it not just against your environment, but against like a dozen other ones. Pufferlib's approach is so simple as to seem obvious. This is the main criticism I've heard. It's like, well, isn't that obvious? 
it really isn't, and I've never seen anybody do this, but let's entertain that for a second. There are many seemingly reasonable ways to accomplish the same task that do not work. For example, several reinforcement learning libraries attempt to natively support hierarchical observations and actions with no flattening. This dramatically complexifies the code base and also prevents multiple important optimizations later in the data pipeline, most notably during vectorization. As shown in figure... I think that should be table one, but whatever. Shown in figure one, emulation overhead is negligible for environments slower than several thousands of steps per second per core. So what I'm saying here, right, is that uh, if you have, if you're not going to use Puffer's emulation, you have to handle structured data natively, meaning at every layer of your uh, your data processing, you have to account for potential structure in the data. So you're dragging all this data processing code throughout all the different layers of your RL stack. And now optimizations that you could make on simpler data, right? Oh, the data is flat. Oh, the data is contiguous, right? You can't make these assumptions anymore because you've done this, right? And this is the way that it is implemented in Jim. This is the way that it is implemented in SB3, uh, even more limited in SB3. So this is not me making up a problem and solving it, right? This is a problem that exists in the most popular reinforcement learning libraries out there. And I'm not aware of a single one that does it like Puffer or really much better than the existing like SB3 gymnasium type uh, type libraries. Some of them are written in C, so they're going to naturally be faster. Uh, some of the more like arcane libraries have this. But even then, they're missing a lot of optimization, so they're going to be slow for certain categories of environments. Pufferlib's emulation layer handles also handles other niche but important compatibility issues. For example, it will perform shape checks on the first batch of data. This catches nearly all user errors but does not add any overhead since the checks are only performed at startup. In multi-agent environments, Pufferlib ensures that the observations and actions are returned in a canonical sorted order. If the environment has a variable number of agents, Pufferlib will pad observations to maintain fixed size data buffers. These are all common sources of difficult to diagnose bugs. So if you only do research on Atari, I'm not speaking to you here, right? I'm speaking to anybody who has attempted to work with more complex environments uh, that aren't as commonly used or accounted for by Jim, Gymnasium, SB3, these libraries, common RL libraries. Uh, they don't have good error checks. They don't have optimized code there. So what we have is we have code that's actually designed for these in mind, and you have a bunch of error checks so that you're not going to get the common story where like you make a change to your environment and you get some crazy backend vectorization error out of Jim or SB3 that you have no idea how to debug. Right, that's like buried inside of 10 wrappers. This happens a lot. Um, so what I'm saying is, you know, we've thought about this a little bit. We're going to have a generally a better user development experience because we've thought about the common issues because after all, Pufferlib came out of eight years worth of suffering building neural MMO without any of these tools, right? Pufferlib currently provides bindings for Atari, ProcGen, NetHack, NeuralMMO, MAgent, MiniGrid, MiniHack, Crafter, Gridly, Pokemon, and more. These are not the only supported environments, just the ones that we have manually tested for dependency and versioning quirks. An updated list is available at pufferai.github.io. Many uh, problem, many widely used environments have unresolved versioning and API compatibility issues with Jim and Gymnasium. This is in addition to the system dependencies resolved by PufferTank. Solution. Pufferlib provides known good bindings for dozens of popular environments. These include Jim and Gymnasium conversion, the standard emulation wrapper, and sometimes additional fixes for specific quirks. There are installation options for each package, such as pip install Pufferlib of Atari, pip install Pufferlib of NetHack, etc. Pufferlib provides additional insurance against poor dependency management. For example, we pin versions for sub packages that are known to ship. Uh, commonly ship breaking changes. There's also a Pufferlib common option which installs the broadest set of mutually compatible environments. This is included with PufferTank by default, so most users should have an out-of-the-box development experience. It was also one of the motivations for building PufferTank in the first places since some of the common environments require additional system packages. Note that Pufferlib does not have a registry by design, so there are no additional requirements for custom environments. So let me talk about that last bit here, because 
I don't know whether this is willingful miscon misconstruction or just lack of familiarity with like environments outside maybe just like the common Atari and Majoko. Um, but what I'm saying here is that Puffer is not this big framework where you have to like register new environments and then like add a custom binding and like maybe write, you know, another class and do a bunch of stuff to make something work with Puffer, right? What I've done here is I've just taken all the common environments and cleaned them up so that they're on the latest version of Gym and Gymnasium. If they have like weird logging, I've cleaned that up, right? If they have like weird things that are slightly off of the API, so they're not quite compatible with the standard APIs, I've shaved those off. I've just done a little bit of housekeeping in RL so that you don't have to do it, right? And I've shipped these with Puffer. This doesn't mean that that's required for any environment to work with Puffer. That just means, hey, we've had really poor environment hygiene, very poor development hygiene. Uh, and this is one of the things I did is I made it easier to use common environments. Heck, you can just import these environments and not even use them with Puffer, right? You can use them with anything else. In fact, that's one of the common things that you're supposed to be able to do with them. Uh, the actual binding for Puffer is, and this is on the main page of the website, is like pufferlib.emulation.gymnasium puffer and gymnasium puffer and for whatever of your environment. That's it. It's a one line wrapper, like I mentioned. That's all that we add. And that does additional, much heavier cleanups, right? That make your environment play nice with SB3, uh, Tiansho, like whatever the other environments, that sample factory, any of the other environment, uh, environment learning libraries, right? Uh, Pufferlib is not adding an additional registry. It's not adding like a gym.register. There's no puffer.register, no additional requirements for custom environments. I'm trying to convey that this is lightweight, that this is not me like just coming up with yet another thing in your stack. This is supposed to strip away complexity, not add complexity. And the best proof of this is to just open up any of the code for Puffer and take a look at the way we do things and see how bloated you think it is compared to some of the other libraries out there. Three point three vectorization. Vectorization is the process of simulating many environments, usually on different cores, which requires aggregating observations and distributing actions. Learning libraries can either use Jim and Gymnasium's built-in vectorization, or they can ship their own. Problem: existing vectorization methods are slow and provide limited or no support for complex environments with structured observations, multiple agents, variable population size, etc. Solution. Pufferlib implements fast and broadly compatible vectorization from scratch. We provide serial, multiprocessing, and array backends with the same API. The greatest focus is on the multiprocessing backend. All the above combined are implemented in only a few hundred lines. It's up to like, I think it is only up to like six, six or seven hundred now. Uh, for additional details, the code is truly quite simple to read. Again, like it's one file. You open the vec file, that's all the vec. Like it's not like, vec dot learning buffer dot async dot like there's no you can open other learning libraries and like have to go through 10 different files to figure out how anything works it's a file with a few hundred lines of code that you can read and see how everything here translates one to one with the code that's hard to show it's hard to show the quality right uh, in a paper like this without me literally pasting the code but this is what i'm trying to convey And now I go through all of the different optimizations. Uh, you can skip a few minutes if you're not interested in the super technical details of this. Many of you maybe are. Uh, so I will try to give these a proper treatment because this is probably one of the more technically complex parts of Puffer because this is how I made Puffer's VEC, which is in Python and compatible with just about anything, fast and faster than just about everything else out there. So first optimization here, a hard assumption on Pufferlib emulation. Earlier, we said that other libraries attempting to implement naive structured data processing would cause issues. This is one such instance. Gymnasium and SB3, the two most popular vectorization implementations, or the libraries that provide the two most popular vectorization implementations, both attempt native support. The Gymnasium implementation misses several crucial opportunities for optimization as a result. The SB3 implementation simply flattens observations without giving the user any way to unflatten them. For some reason, 
it does this on the main process and with a rather inefficient implementation. By comparison, Pufferlib's implementation is shorter, faster, and more flexible. The features described below would be quite difficult to implement otherwise. Native multi-agent support. Most vectorization implementations, including petting zoos, bolt this on with unoptimized wrappers. Both SB3 and Gymnasium have made clear there will never be official multi-agent support. So basically, they made a wrapper that like treats your multi-agent environment as a bunch of single agent environments and does a bunch of really inefficient processing and like puts them all on separate processes or tries to or mocks that or whatever and it's a mess anybody who's tried to use it knows it's a mess we designed from the ground up multi-agent is first class citizen python implementation of nfool Standard vectorization simulates M environments in parallel and requires waiting on all M before returning observations. So you simulate a bunch of environments, you have to wait on all of them to get all the observations at once. Pufferlib can instead retrieve N much less than M observations. So you can retrieve a subset uh, of the observations from all the different environments. This has two important implications. First, by setting M equal to 2N, Simulation becomes approximately double buffered, which means that CPU cores are processing half the environments while the GPU computes actions for the other half, right? So you get data from CPU, you're running it on the GPU, you're computing your actions, but while you're doing that, the other half of the environments are still running their step operation. So you're interleaving computation so that your CPUs are not left idle while you're doing the forward pass. Second, by setting M much greater than 2N, the model no longer has to wait on the slowest environments before returning a batch of observations. So you have a bunch of environments and you have you just want a smaller number of observations, you can grab it from the first ones to return, from the fastest ones. This feature is especially important in complex environments which tend to have more branching logic paths and therefore more variable step times. At time of writing, this is the only existing Python implementation of EnvPool as opposed to the original EnvPool that supports select C++ environments. Uh, I was made aware that there's something kind of similar in Tiansho, and they really messed up because they like, they didn't mess up the implementation, they messed up the naming of the implementation, so I wasn't aware of it before. Like, they kind of renamed everything to be like, and they, they reused existing words that mean set things to mean different things, so it was really confusing. They have something kind of asynchronous-ish, but it doesn't have all these optimizations built in, for sure. And I went through it and I found some of the same errors as uh, SB3. Multiple environments per worker. Pufferlib allows you to specify the number of environments and the number of workers respectively. When a worker is responsible for multiple environments, it efficiently stacks data returned by each sub-environment in pre-allocated arrays without performing any extra copies. This feature is important when running many more environments than your machine has cores, and it avoids clogging the system with small processes. So, we have a way to run multiple environments per core without copying the data a whole bunch of extra times. And if you're naive, if you're really naive like Gymnasium, you run one process per environment and you clog everything up. If you're a little bit smarter, then you stack the data across processes, but then you're doing a bunch of extra copies. And then when you really optimize it, you do this. Shared data for memory for data communication. Did I say, yeah, shared memory for data communication. We load observations, rewards, terminals, truncated, and actions. This is the standard RL API, this is Jim, Gymnasium. You know what this API is if you work in RL, right? Don't need to define it separately. Uh, we load these signals into large shared arrays. We use pipes, which are up to 10 times faster than queues due to a Python quirk for communicating infos. Empty infos are pruned and we provide wrappers to aggregate them over episodes. As a result, only one step per episode requires any inter-process communication. So you can see the level of optimization being done here, right? Like the first thing that you notice when you start optimizing inter-process communication is that Python queues are slow, so you go to pipes. And then you notice that pipes are still taking a whole 40 microseconds, which we can't have that, right? So what we do is we push the communication into arrays, but we can't always do that because you can't put arbitrary data into arrays. You can only put numerical data into arrays. Infos are arbitrary data, right? You have uh, dictionaries and other things. So what I do is we aggregate that information as much as possible so we only pipe stuff very infrequently. This gives you a big performance speed up. Uh, by comparison, SB3 does not have shared memory at all. 
and Gymnasium provides a slower shared memory implementation that attempts to handle structured data natively, common theme, requiring multiple small copy operations and additional Python logic. So this is where them dragging structured processing in costs them. Shared flags for signaling. Worker processes busy wait on unlock shared array flags to detect when actions are ready and update the flag after computing observations. This is what I was alluding to a moment ago. This almost completely eliminates inter-process communication overhead. Pipes are only used when an environment returns non-empty infos, which will be once per episode when using our wrappers. So I, uh, I kind of like duplicate a little bit here. Shared memory for data communication, shared flags for signaling. Uh, there are a couple different things going on there that you'll see and understand a bit more if you read the code, but I really wanted to emphasize that like we're both using shared memory, but also we're using the shared memory for the flags to tell processes when to do things rather than waiting on like lockable objects or even the unlocked ones still have too much overhead in Python. Zero copy batching. For environments with large observations, we provide a setting to load batches of data directly from shared memory by waiting on a contiguous subset of worker process indices. Other settings require one copy, a native implementation not using shared memory would require two or three copies. So what this is, right, let's say you have environments that require a ton of bandwidth and you don't want to have extra copy operations because the environment is fast, just produces a ton of data. What you can do is instead of waiting on a subset of environments, just any subset, right, the first environments to return, you can wait on a contiguous block of environments. And the reason for this is when you do fancy indexing, right, when you say, okay, I want like array of indices and that indices array is not like a contiguous subset or is not a slice, then you actually incur an extra copy operation. Whereas when you do uh, an indexing operation that's like elements one through 10, since that is in the same block of memory, that does not trigger a copy. So that's what's going on here. And it's a quite efficient trick. It's kind of cool to see that for some environments, it just makes stuff faster. Four separately optimized code paths. For fast environments, main process overhead has to be optimized to within a few microseconds. Even operations like manipulating process IDs in a list can result in noticeable performance drops. Thanks, Python. We identify and separately optimize four common workload cases. In the synchronous case, environments are split evenly across cores and loading into a single uh, and loaded into a single batch of shared memory with no extra copy operations. In the fully asynchronous case, data is taken from the first workers to finish, requiring a single copy operation to load the batch into contiguous memory. There's a special case of the latter where each batch is simulated on a single worker so it can be loaded without additional copies. There's also the above zero copy case, which is roughly equivalent to a, uh, a circular buffer of batches. So I came up with four different ways in which to invoke the vectorization. Uh, so it's not just like a one size fits all solution, right? It's actually there are four separate pathways that get triggered. But again, the code's only a few hundred lines. You can see that there's like a conditional in the way that the data is gathered. And it's like a few lines of code for each, but it makes a big difference because like really fast environments can't afford lots of tiny bits of overhead from gathering stuff into lists, for instance, right? The synchronous case can't afford to like have the additional logic from looping over uh, indices instead of blocks of indices since they're, you're waiting on them all at the same time anyways. So like each of the different common cases that we see is optimized separately and uh, test it against, again, all the different environments in Puffer. This is the idea. You have all these environments supported. That means you have all the test cases that you would ever need in order to make sure this stuff is really fast. And you'll see the result of that in a moment. Oh, and the last one here is an auto-tune utility. Obtaining the best configuration for your environment and hardware requires testing all four code paths. So we provide a utility that benchmarks valid vectorization settings. Just takes a little bit of the guesswork out. Models. Pufferlib provides an optional model format that splits the normal Puff, uh, PyTorch forward function into separate encode and decode functions. I should mention that Pufferlib doesn't have PyTorch as a hard dependency. Uh, it's just like our demos use PyTorch, but Puffer itself is like NumPy arrays and stuff. You can go use it with Jax if you want to. You can go use it with whatever else if you want to. We might pick up a tiny grad binding soon. We'll see. But like, there aren't any hard assumptions deep in the code for that, right? This is all like the surface level demo stuff and uh, like extra integrations. 
uh, the encode and decode function split. This allows pufferlib to sandwich an LSTM between the computation of hidden states and actions. We apply this operation as a wrapper, meaning that LSTM support becomes optional and configurable per experiment without having to write two models. Without having to write two models. Uh, users are free to disregard this feature and use other frameworks for LSTM support or implement it manually. However, our users have found this feature important since LSTM shape a state reshaping operations are one of the most common sources of difficult to diagnose bugs. So this is a common thing with the different features in Puffer. And uh, this is just a good example, a good case to make this point, right? I worked in RL for eight years on one of the most complicated environments out there, right? Neural MMO. And I ran lots of experiments over that time. And I've made basically every possible error out there. And for the ones that keep coming up very often, I've tried to make it easier for users to not fall into those common pathways, right? And one of them is that there's this annoying transpose reshape thing that you have to do with LSTMs in order to batch correctly. And if you do it wrong, everything will run as you would expect, but you actually won't be getting the benefit of the memory from the LSTM. Uh, but it can look good on paper sometimes because technically you still have extra weights. There's a lot of weird stuff that can happen there. So I provide stuff like this optionally, not forcing it on you, to potentially save you some headache, right? Oh, and here, Pufferlib includes a few baseline models such as the original Nature CNN and Resonant models from DQN and Impala respectively. There's also a default architecture which defines an MLP size to the flat observation and action spaces. This is useful for smaller test environments. All base models directly subclass torch.nn.module. There's no additional module le model layer required by Pufferlib. Not a framework, right? There's no pufferlib.model. No fancy API to learn. I want to make one small update to this right here as it stands. When I wrote this paper, um, the first party environments in Puffer Ocean were just like little simple test environments, the ones I'm about to describe. Since then, Puffer Ocean has grown to encompass all the new cool environments that I've been developing, as well as ones that are being contributed by other users. So what is called Ocean here is probably going to be renamed to Ocean.Sanity in the next patch. And then all this applies as is, but it applies to Ocean.Sanity, not to Ocean as a whole, as it will be in the next update. Uh, problem. Discovering breaking changes to algorithm implementations, which often result from seemingly innocuous tweaks, requires several training several environments for multiple hours each and the spare hardware to do so. Solution, Puffer Ocean is a suite of environments that are trivial with correct implementation, implementations, excuse me, and impossible with specific common bugs. Each environment trains in under a minute on a single CPU core and the entire suite can be trained, tracked and saved on Wanbi over a quick coffee break. The current set of environments are well, let's see, there's squared, which is this target finding environment. There's password, which requires you to guess a password. Um, there is a stochastic environment, which requires you to learn a non-deterministic policy. There's a memory task, which is impossible if your policy doesn't have some form of memory. There's a multi-agent task that's fundamentally dependent on uh, different, different actions for each agent. There is a spaces environment that requires you to be able to process structured uh, observation spaces, and then there's a classic multi-armed bandit problem. To be absolutely clear, we never want to see scores on ocean.sanity reported in a comparative baseline. This is a sanity check only. Our PPO implementations solve each environment score greater than 0.9 in roughly 30k interactions with a single set of barely tuned hyperparameters. So I'm saying this because I've seen academics do this before, where like somebody will publish a really simple set of environments or whatever, and then they'll go, well, my algorithm is better than your algorithm because it does better on this really simple environment. That's not what this is for. This is not for comparison, right? This is for you debugging your algorithm and seeing if, seeing if it's working at all. This is like a low bar and like, one algorithm solving this in a few in fewer interactions than another, or one getting like 0.95 versus 0.96 probably doesn't matter. That's not the point. This is for bug checking. This is to help you during development, not to include in your paper. You can include in your paper that yeah, check mark it passes ocean sanity if you want, but that's about it. Performance. 
Pufferlib's emulation layer typically adds a few tens of microseconds to simulation time. I think I should be a little bit more specific here. Uh, this is based on something I've discovered since submitting this, and it doesn't contradict anything, uh, but it's more dependent on it's more dependent on environment bandwidth than it is on speed. Um, so you'd probably want to make some graph of like time to simulate environment versus size of observations or something like that, and then look at the overhead. But the thing is, it's not really going to matter because Puffer is just always going to be faster anyways. Um, so really, it's negligible regardless. But I just wanted to add a little clarity there. As shown in table one, we'll get to that. Uh, overhead is negligible for environments slower than a few thousand steps per second, provided they don't have crazy high bandwidth. Still true. Emulation works by inferring... This is complicated. Emulation works by inferring a NumPy structured array data type from the environment's gym or gymnasium observation and action spaces. So it infers a struct type. It says, okay, this is what your environment says its data looks like. This is a struct that matches that data format. This is an analog to C structs that provide an efficient NumPy interface over structured data in contiguous memory. So that's the reason, right? You essentially can take your data and put it into something that is backed by C structs in contiguous memory. Conveniently, we can use structured arrays as flat bytes, as is required for efficient vectorization. So you can just do like array.bytes or something similar, uh, or with dict-like accessors, as is required by the model and environment. So you can do like array, you can actually do stuff like observation.players.health or whatever, if it defines players defines health, and you'll get all the health values for the different players. It's really, really nice and convenient, but you can also view it as flat bytes because it's contiguous. So very, very nice data. Uh, this critical piece of code is siphonized and tested to be faster than a half dozen implementations from earlier in development, including efforts to write it in C and Rust. We actually used to get more out of Cython here than we do now. Uh, now the NumPy portion has been optimized so well that the Cython only adds a little bit. I think there's still a meaningful uh, performance difference for the pack, but not for the unpack. But, you know, regardless, um, tested to be faster than a half dozen implementations from earlier in development, including efforts to write it in C and Rust. I don't know why I was doing that, but, you know, I did it and it didn't work as well as just what I have here. Suffice that our implementation is at least probably faster than the naive one-off script that users would have to write for any specific environment otherwise. So what's the alternative to Puffer, right? Well, if you wanted to do this for your specific environment without using Pufferlib, you'd have to basically write a pack and unpack. So you have to take your structured data, which maybe has different data types, put it to flat bytes, and then get your data back out of those bytes in batched form before the model needs it, and not mess up any of like the data type conversions or byte order or things like that. If you mess that up, your model will fail silently without any errors, right? It just won't learn. Very, very difficult to debug. Also, this operation took quite a lot of time, probably more than anything else other than maybe vectorization and puffer to make fast. Um, so if you're doing this naively, probably ours will be better. That's all I was claiming here. Pufferlib's vectorization is faster than both the gymnasium and SB3 implementations in almost all cases, even without our mpool feature enabled, which provides most of the speed up. Table in a second. The following comparisons are worst case scenario for Pufferlib. Okay, so this is what I want to be clear on here. I gave very objective performance metrics, right? Not only did I give very objective performance metrics that make Pufferlib look very good, they're the worst possible case for Pufferlib in multiple different ways, and you'll see why. Um, if I were being, I'm not even going to say unfair, like to the other environment, uh, to the other libraries. If I were just being like even keel. The table that you'll, you're about to see would be like Pufferlib, fast, other environments, uh, other libraries, crash, crash, bug, segfault, slow, slow, segfault, crash. That's what it would look like. Um, so I'm being very, very fair to these libraries in multiple different ways. Following comparisons are worst case scenario for Puffer. Here's the first one, because they also rely on Pufferlib's emulation. The fairer comparison would be to time Pufferlib's emulation and vectorization versus other implementations without Puffer emulation. So we're giving them the benefit of our emulation layer uh, and then timing vectorization. And if we didn't, 
This would trigger inefficient code paths such as gymnasium structured shared memory processing and SB3's main thread flattening. However, several of the test environments simply would not work without Pufferlib's emulation. So what I'm saying here, right, is that with Puffer's emulation, this is how it's meant to be used if you do on top of that want to use SB3. You trigger their fastest code paths and you don't trigger any of the buggy ones, right? By comparison, and this is one that you have to just believe me on, um, we never explicitly tested any of these environments with gymnasium and SB3 vectorization before this, and they all worked on the first try. So we couldn't get them working with gymnasium and SB3 native, but they all worked on the first try here. Let's look at these tables. Um, so there are two different devices. I'll look at those in a second. Uh, but the first performance numbers on the top, those come from a desktop with a high-end CPU. And the one on the bottom, you have D slash L, that's desktop slash laptop. I tested on a desktop, I tested on a laptop, right? So you can see I have lots of different environments. Uh, you can see that they have varying steps per second, varying speeds. They have varying different patterns in the way that the compute is allocated. Some take a very long time to reset. Some have a very high variance between how long it takes for one step versus another. Some of them are very consistent. Some are fast, some are slow. You get lots and lots of different numbers here. So very nice coverage, right? And then if you look at the environments uh, for vectorization at the bottom there, you can see the tremendous gap in performance. So neural MMO, that one I actually couldn't get Gymnasium or SB3 to work, so there's no way to fairly compare it. So that's just puffer speed. Uh, but the rest of them have comparisons. So you can see NetHack doesn't even get any benefit from vectorization in Gym or SB3. We make it like more than 10x faster. MiniHack goes from 11k up to 55k. Pokemon, at least with our async mode, goes from 5k to 7.2. Some of the really fast environments are tremendously faster with puffer. So instead of capping at like 100k, frames per second, 100k steps per second, we get up to millions. For proc gen, we go from 41k up to 150k. It's a little weirdly slow in the synchronous case. Uh, that's probably some little quirk. I, I That'll be fixed by next update. But generally, you know, the uh, async version is massively faster. Breakout, Atari, a uh, very important one because a lot of research happens on Atari. 4.8k up to 11.8 synchronous, same API, drop in more than twice as fast, or async, like 5x faster, more than 5x faster, actually, uh, 25.6 thousand. And since then, I've actually made it even better. I found some better wrappers. I've got it up to 60,000 uh, since then. And yeah, I could apply those same optimizations to Jim and SP3, but they wouldn't get as much out of them because they have the they have bottlenecks that Pufferlib doesn't, right? And you can see that from all the other numbers. Crafter, this is a one that I like to make a good point about. Crafter, if you look at the chart above, it has really high percent reset time. Uh, so if you have one of your environments that's stuck resetting, you're just waiting and waiting and waiting for it to be done resetting. Uh, so for that reason, it gets no benefit from vectorization from Gymnasium or SB3 practically, maybe a little bit of benefit there. Uh, but Puffer goes all the way up to 2.8K, which is still unusably slow, but it's faster than the alternatives. And I guess people were already using Crafter before this vectorization, I don't know how when it's that slow, but you know, with Puffer, it's at least reasonable. And then mini grid from 54K up to 151 or 210 with pooling. So these are our main objective results, right? You have the stats of the hardware there, uh, i9 14900K, 4090, and my laptop, which has a i7 10 750H, six core, and an RTX 3070. Gymnasium and SB3 multiprocessing implementations experience significant scaling degradation above a thousand synchronizations per second per core. They clog stuff with a lot of small processes. Uh, instead of doing this, Pufferlib provides an optimized implementation for running multiple environments per core. This is why we get the environments that are in the millions above a hundred thousand steps per second, because we'll just do like in serial several cart pole environments on one core, several ocean environments on one core, and then uh, you know, we aggregate those in bigger batches at the same time. That gets us way, way, way faster. The other major source of, imp of performance improvement is Pufferlib's end pool implementation. This is another place where our benchmarks are unfair to our own implementation. The tests are run without a model in the loop, and a major benefit of end pool is allowing the environments to continue computing observations while the policy is computing actions. This can drive idle GPU time to zero. 
So what I'm saying here, right, is I'm being even more unfair to myself here because in our async implementation, right, you get a batch of observations from the environments and then you put those onto the GPU to compute actions. And then while you're doing that, right, the environments in the background are still running. So you're, you're getting time out of that. But the thing is, the GPU forward pass takes time. So normally you have, uh, if your forward pass takes longer, if your forward pass takes longer than that second block of environments, then your environment is essentially infinitely fast. Because as soon as your GPU is done with some data, you have new data ready, right? So I'm being very unfair because without accounting for the time of the model forward pass, um, you're really not getting anywhere near as much out of uh, the async, and you can still see the benefit of our async. So I thought I would include that. And even in this worst case scenario, we generally obtain at least a 30 to 40% per performance improvement. It's very highly variable uh, with nfool. And there are important cases where this improvement can be much larger. For instance, crafter being six times faster. I mentioned the long reset times. Uh, you also might have noticed that Pufferlib scales better on the desktop than on the laptop. The chipset there has eight performance cores and eight slow efficiency cores, P cores, E cores. Uh, so this is a very uh, an increasingly common design in high-end Intel chips. SB3 and Gymnasium are bottlenecked by the slowest environment and the slowest core, while Pufferlib will retrieve observations from the first environment to finish processing. So not only is there variability to account for from the environments, there's also variability to account for from modern hardware that Pufferlib can better leverage. Almost done here. First party, first party training with clean Pufferl. By design, Pufferlib does not include a library of learning algorithm implementations. We have no plans to develop one, at least not unless the users really want it. Instead, we provide integrations with CleanRL and SB3. Nobody uses the SB3 one because the CleanRL one is so good, uh, with more integrations to be added based on user demand. With that said, CleanRL is designed to be modified by users, and we do maintain one heavily customized version of CleanRL's PPO uh, implementation for testing and for baselines. It's been expanded with a bunch of features, separate training and evaluation, model saving and checkpointing, faster LSTM support, better logging, WANB integration, asynchronous environment simulation, additional features for multi-agent logging, lots and lots of things. We include a runner file with a CLI for all included Pufferlib environments, clean YAML configs. There are actually any files in the new dev branch, which is even better. And integration with WANB for tracking, baselines, and hyperparameter tuning. And just to show you the nice little CLI, this is what you get right here. When you run in your terminal, you get this nice little monitor where you can track everything in addition to WANB. Proof of impact. Pufferlib's already been widely used, even more so since I submitted this because the stars have gone to the moon. We highlight two major successes that were powered by Puffer, trademark, registered, all the things. Uh, our emulation features made the NURPS 2023 Neural MMO competition possible. No learning library could handle Neural MMO 2.0 natively, and Pufferlib enabled participants to train competent policies in as little as eight hours on a single GPU. So all the dash marks right on Gymnasium and SB3 and all that uh, above in the table were these libraries do not work with Neural MMO, they just crash or like whatever. For comparison, this is an environment that can take weeks to get up and running, despite good dependency management, purely because of existing vectorization and learning libraries uh, not being designed for environments of this complexity, being many agents, variable population size, structured observations and actions, etc. Let's be clear here, Neural MMO is also my environment. I have no incentive to tell you that it's very hard to set up and use, or that it was very hard to set up and use for years, it makes me look very dumb. Uh, even though if you actually know the context, you know what a hard problem that was. But still, uh, Pufferlib made it so much easier to do stuff with. And you can ask the competition participants. There are lots of them around in the Discord. Competition attracted 200 participants and far fewer complaints about the complexity of the baselines than in previous years. Second major RL project is RL for Pokemon Red, originally by Peter Whitten. Shortly after it was released in a viral YouTube video, we began helping port the project to Pufferlib onboarding interesting contributors, and providing computational resources. The results are not yet published, but the model has improved several fold over the original project, and the logging, visualization, and performance enhancements provided by Pufferlib were instrumental in the success. 
The current code for this is also open source. Training runs 7,000 steps per second with clean puffer all on a single desktop, which is two to three times the performance of the original SB3 project. That's end-to-end -end training speed. Remember, the tables were not fair to puffer. Puffer's actually faster, right, when you run the whole thing in a loop. This corresponds to roughly 3,000 times real-time simulation with an aggressive 24 frame skip. So I picked a couple of projects. They're both ones that I'm pretty involved in. I have collaborations with other labs working on things that are not yet public, right, that I can't talk about because you know, they want to have that be on the conference cycle. PufferLib's pretty new. It's only been a full-time project for a few months now. So there'll be more, but these were the ones that I could talk about and include here. Limitations. PufferLib does not yet support continuous action spaces. It actually does now. This is dated. Shows you how quick the dev cycle is. That didn't take very long at all. Uh, so I said it's relatively straightforward. Plan for within the next few minor updates. I delivered it within the next few minor updates, right? PufferLib does not have integrations with every major learning library. I was just looking for limitations. Honestly, you can just do pufferlib.emulation.gymnasium puffer end of your environment and then put your environment into any other learning library and it'll work. So really, it's fine the way that it is there. Uh, let's see. Missing some of the newer gymnasium spaces. Yeah, they're like different data space types for observations. Nobody really uses them. That one doesn't matter very much. Uh, the one that does bother me is there are a few edge cases in vectorization where for some reason, Pufferlib synchronous multiprocessing is slower than Gymnasium, or I think maybe even SB3. There's a weird quirk with OS process switching with very specific workloads. Um, I'm going to figure that one out. It's very rare for that to happen. Um, there will either be a fallback option or I'll just figure it out. Uh, while we provide our integration with Neural MMO as evidence of our library's efficacy in complex multi-agent domains, there are no good multi-agent vectorization implementations to compare against. So literally, I can't give you a number for how fast somebody else's multi-agent vec is because nobody has any that's decent that you can just run on its own without a bunch of additional steps, right? And like, seriously, this is something that just, you'd be amazed that this doesn't exist, but it doesn't exist. Fought with deprecated petting zoo wrappers for a while, but they didn't work with neural MMO, and that alone should be a good indicator of Puffer's impact. Conclusion. Pufferlib provides flat, fast and flexible tools for reinforcement learning. The majority of new users will benefit immediately from improved performance and a smoother development experience. However, the real value of Pufferlib is the ease with which researchers can move their work to more complex and interesting environments, which have traditionally been difficult to work with. We hope that Pufferlib will allow the field to explore new ideas hitherto constrained by the simplicity of readily available environments. So that's the paper. Let's talk about some stuff. This has been rejected from three conferences at this point. Um, if you're familiar with RL and how bothersome these problems are and how much time they cost, uh, I, you, that will be ridiculous enough on its own. But let me talk about why and give my thoughts on some of the problems with the way that research is evaluated and what is considered to be useful and what is not considered to be useful. First conference, NeurIPS last year. Rejected mostly as out of scope. I submitted to data sets and benchmarks. They basically decided, hey, we don't like software contributions. They wrote in the review, you know, you know software is valuable, but not at NeurIPS, basically. Uh, it was in the call for papers that you aren't supposed to do that. Um, but these things, you can't really appeal them once the decisions have been made. And uh, you know, they're like, they weasel their way around because the language is somewhat vague there. So what did I do? I put together an open letter, uh, which was signed by a huge number of people, had lots of like testimonies in it as well, saying, hey, we need language in the data sets and benchmarks track to better project, protect submissions like this from being rejected purely as out of scope, right? We shouldn't be rejecting tools that we rely on from being published because that hamstrings our ability to make progress. That was the argument. 
And I went back and forth. It was a whole bunch of emails. And eventually, uh, I got the full support of the DNB board for that. And it went to the NeurIPS committee, and they added it. And then this year, they had the language, you know, we you know, invite submissions from open source libraries and tools that enable or accelerate ML research. So underline in bold, clear as possible. This type of stuff is explicitly in scope. You don't have to do a bunch of experiments, right? You just need to have something that enables or accelerates ML research, open source libraries and tools. So I thought, great. Uh, in the meantime, RLC happened, so I submitted it to RLC as well. Uh, that was, that one was more unfortunate, and I don't really want to blame the organizers too, too much for this, because it was a new conference. Uh, I know some of the organizers, they're really trying hard to put on something good for the field. Um, I will address it a little bit because I think that the response should have been better to this. Um, obviously, I'm not like I'm not going to ask the people that I personally know to personally investigate something on my own paper. That wouldn't be right. But you know, the the broader response to it um, was a bit rough. So what happened there was there was a technical reviewer and a senior reviewer. Technical reviewer is just supposed to say, is this work correct or not, right? So it's supposed to give you the first pass, and then the senior reviewer goes through in more detail. But like, if something's obviously incorrect, you can save a lot of time by rejecting a lot of the bad papers. So what the technical reviewer did um, was they wrote a review that just said, like, here are a bunch of typos. And it, they made me look very stupid. Uh, there are a couple ones in here, a couple very small ones, but these were like egregious typos, right? These are like you didn't proofread anything whatsoever. It wasn't just like you missed a tense on a verb or something, right? It was like you wrote incoherent stuff. So that makes me look dumb, right? That makes me look really dumb for the senior reviewer and especially for the AC. Uh, the problem was that those typos did not exist in my paper. They were made up. So there are only two possibilities here, right? One is that uh, the less charitable interpretation is that the TR intentionally sabotaged my paper by submitting a fraudulent review. I don't think that that's what happened. Uh, I think that it, this was a matter of laziness. I think that they pasted my paper into ChatGPT or whatever language model of choice that you have, and that model hallucinated a bunch of typos, and then they didn't bother to check to see if what they wrote was correct, and they just submitted it. So why would you sign up to be a reviewer if you're going to do this so that you can put RLC reviewer on your resume. Very dishonest, not malicious, but definitely lazy, and definitely did end up sabotaging my work. So then the uh, the senior review was actually positive on Puffer, but then the meta review, looking at the negative TR and the positive senior review, uh, rejected my paper, and there was no window for me to make any commentary on these things. There was no discussion period. There was supposed to be one, but you know, we'll give them the pass on that. It's first conference, right? They're not always going to be able to get discussions on all the papers. Fine. So I wrote back to them like, hey, this isn't fair. I wrote to the, the chairs or whatever, the program committee, uh, this isn't fair. This first review is fraudulent, and it clearly biased the AC, right? They said like, taking into account these two things, and you can check the reviews, right? Uh, I posted a lot of these on Twitter already a long time ago. Uh, they said, like, based on these, we're going to toss this uh, toss this paper. And then I emailed them and said, look, I emailed them and they said, look, the decisions are final. Like, this is disappointing. We know, but the decisions are final. And I said, like, okay, well, that's, that's a dumb blanket policy to have, right? Because this is, this is fraudulent. Um, but fine, this is your first year on the conference. Like, you have tons and tons of work, I know. Uh, fine. Can you at least do something about the TR? This person should not be allowed to review. And they're, if they're a university student, their university should be informed. If they're working at a company, their company should be informed because this is lazy, dishonest, and sabotaged my work, right? I'm not saying it was malicious, but it was lazy and it did result in biasing the reviews of my work. No response, couldn't get a reply. So I think that they dropped the ball in the reply to that, but overall, not too, too mad uh, at RLC as a whole. First year, I know the organizers are trying. I would have appreciated a better response, but fine. After all, it's going to get into NeurIPS, right? Um, NeurIPS is the bigger conference. I would have liked to have gone and showed this off at RLC to R all the RL people, right? That's really where it should have gone, but fine. We'll do it at the big conference at NeurIPS, and I'll save myself some travel. It's explicitly in scope. 
It's way stronger than before. It was just tossed on out of scope last year. It's way better, right? The results are so much stronger. Surely it doesn't get tossed. Well, pretty much the same paper. Maybe I rewrote it a little different, but it was basically the same as the RLC one, which nobody really had a problem with there, um, the, the language at least. Um, I had the first review being mildly positive, asking for some additional clarifications, uh, which I provided. And these reviews, I'll make them public. I believe I'm allowed to do that after the review period is over. So those will be public soon. Remind me if I forget. Initially positive. Second review, also initially positive, asked for some additional information. Third review, like confident, uh, three, clear reject, keyboard warrior, like 60 bullet points. And here I'm going to be less charitable. There are only a few possibilities. One, this is uh, a case of like the person decided that they didn't like the paper and then just mashed a bunch of nonsense so that there would be too many things for me to possibly reply to. Uh, and some of the bullet points don't even make any sense. I'll get into that. Uh, second possibility is that they just used a language model in order to write all this, and then they just pasted it, and then they like got angry when I challenged it, and they defended it, right? A uh, couple other things that could have happened, but that's like that's the main interpretation. So I wrote a little note to the AC. I said, I, this could either be, I don't know what this is, I don't know if this is a language model, but like this is ridiculous, right? How can you, how can this be a review? Um, you can't just write 60 bullet points. Some of the bullet points, one of them, here, this I can share. One of the bullet points, oops. One of the bullet points asked me what this is. Is this a CPU? Come on. You're either, it's either a VLM that doesn't know how to process image proce uh, process images properly, or it's a reviewer like intentionally asking too many questions so that I can't answer them all, right? And they asked me to like define words and stuff like that, that like, you know, Google dictionary, one of those, right? Um, so really just obvious bad faith, lazy review. Uh, I don't even know if lazy, just definitely bad faith review though. Lazy if it's a language model, bad faith otherwise. I think maybe a combination of both because parts of it seemed at least handwritten. Um, so then I replied to the first reviewer. I haven't heard back on that one yet. I replied to the second reviewer. I provide all the information that they ask for. I show, hey, look, it's even way faster than when I originally did this. Our end-to-end -end benchmarks are really good. We're adding new environments. You know, we've gotten tons of additional users. The library is doing really well. The project is well supported and so on, right? And I also, I clarified like, hey, look, I know that you're looking for additional experiments, but these are not required this year. DNB changed their policy, and now this is explicitly in scope under libraries and tools that enable or accelerate ML research. The performance numbers alone should suffice. The convenience utilities also enable ML research, right, so on and so forth. And uh, they dug their heels in and decided that uh, the main complaint that they had wasn't the information. They decided that their main complaint, which they had alluded, they had mentioned in the first one, I think the third reviewer had more of a problem with it, but they said, this is just not professional writing. And the second reviewer went as far as to say that publishing this paper could damage the credibility of NeurIPS as a venue. I'm not damaging the field by writing this, right? I'm not damaging the field's credibility by writing a paper that has some somewhat like engaging topic sentences on things and still has all the information, right? You're damaging the field by treating the review process in this way. And it's very disappointing um, because when you look at this, right, this is not the way that conventional papers are written, but it's not that unorthodox, right? This is not just like a sales pitch. This is not me like making a bunch of crazy claims. This is me trying to position a library that's intended to address a lot of the common frustrations in reinforcement learning and appealing to the common sentiment that I've gotten from talking to literally every single student, maybe not professor, but every student who has ever had to sit down and write the code themselves to get the day-to-day -day work done. That's what I'm going for. And um, to have something like this tossed on the basis of not liking the writing style, 
and having that damage the credibility of NeurIPS when the credibility of NeurIPS is people writing like Keyboard Warrior 60 bullet point essays, just making up every possible thing and asking for clarification. And then I forget if I mentioned this, but uh, asking for clarification, getting the clarification, seeing that the library is even better than I previously described, and then downrating uh, their score from an accept to a clear reject. I think that's damaging the credibility of NeurIPS as a venue. I mean, what's science for, right? Science is for progress. I'm making something here that enables the field to make progress. It's clearly in scope. And you care more about the substance of having, you know, in somewhat more engaging writing, something that's a little bit drier, something that has, sure, a little bit of opinionated writing in it, but has plenty of clear fact, has plenty of clear evidence behind it, and is really trying to position a library as something to address common problems. Just the lack of respect for that type of work is really rough. Because I don't think it's just the writing, right? I think that's like the thing that they grab onto as the thing that they grab onto as like the reason that we have to reject a thing. Uh, I've ha had to deal with this over the last like eight years. I know so many people in RL who have just left and said, screw it, I'm out because of this. But there's just a fundamental lack of respect for people developing libraries, tools, and doing engineering style work. I view my role in reinforcement learning as not just sitting down and writing math, right? Not just writing proofs, not necessarily just writing code, but doing whatever is required to push the field forward. I started out more on the experimental side and it became clear to me through my work on neural MMO that that was not what was holding the field back. The thing that was really holding the field back was not having the infrastructure and the tools to do the experiments that we wanted in the first place and to do them fast enough. So that's what I went into. My playbook shifted to be heavier on the engineering side. Yes, yeah, still some experimental stuff, occasionally some math, but heavier on the engineering side. But you're not allowed to do that. Like academia is supposed to be the place for new ideas, but it's really only the place for new ideas if your ideas fit into the orthodox way in which progress is allowed to be done, right? If you're doing work that looks like you're writing algorithms, conducting experiments, and increasing benchmarks, then that's fine. But if you're doing work that's saying, hey, uh, these benchmarks are really slow, and if we could run them faster, that would push the field forward. Or if you're saying, hey, these benchmarks are really simple, uh, and the reason that they're simple is because you don't have the tools enabled in order to run these experiments on more interesting environments, that for some reason isn't allowed. So I don't really think that you can look at this and say that this is defending the integrity of science in, a, in any ways, especially when like there's such a big reproducibility crisis in ML, but especially in reinforcement learning. I mean, the majority of papers that I see do not reproduce at this point. They don't replicate, I should say. And all this is open source. You can go play around with all of it. That was included in the reviews and all in all the places, right? It's included um, single blind. And you can go run all the demos. You can see that these things all work as intended. You can even look at the code and see everything is very simple and there's nothing hiding. It's like a few thousand lines of code. It's not, it's not hundreds of thousands of lines of code. <sighs> it's very disappointing to do all of that and then to not even be able to share my work at, at a conference venue, right? Because that definitely helps. But thus far, like, what's the point of the peer review system when literally at this point, Twitter and YouTube are way, way, way more helpful for distributing my work? It's way more consistent. I can showcase something interesting I've done. People will see it. People will discuss it. And I don't have, like, anonymous reviewers, like, trashing my work for the sake of like some weird idea of orthodox gatekeeping. And that's not to say that I don't know how to write papers in the academic style either, right? I had a very good cycle last year. I had a lot of different things published. Um, but the problem is that like 
that style is not always conducive. The style that is required to get a paper in, let's say that they weren't, that there was no bias against tooling and systems, the style that's required to get a paper published is not necessarily the style that is required for your paper to have impact, right? If I were to cut out all of the uh, the summary and the topic sentences and all that stuff, this would be a significantly less accessible paper because what I'm doing is I'm speaking to I'm speaking to shared experience in the RL community. If you have to go write out and enumerate like SB3 has this bug, you know, uh, Jim has this bug, right? If I have to go list like pages and pages of bugs instead of just saying, hey, these things are buggy, or if I have to go through and say, like, you're not allowed to say that like Puffer is making libraries work the way that they're supposed to, you have to immediately interrupt the flow of that with a bajillion points of evidence, even though that they're later in the paper. If you're not allowed to write in a way that conveys the high level purpose of what your work is doing, then the reason for the library even existing, the reason for why these tools are here and the reason that they're important just gets lost in a bunch of stats, right? So the stats are there, they're just padded in a way to make this useful to researchers who maybe you're doing RL but you're not super deep on the tooling and infra side, right? I tried to make this thing useful regardless. If you are deep on the tooling infrastructure, a tooling and infrastructure side, you're gonna read this paper, get the idea, and then go read the source code anyways, right? But if you're not, I wanted it to still be applicable. And just for taking like that little bit of a liberty, it's no, get out, right? So that's tough. Um, but I wanted to give voice to it because I've been, I was, I've not been very vocal about that during my PhD. I didn't want it to reflect poorly on, you know, my lab, my advisor, any of those things, because they're all great, right? Um, but now I can be a little bit more vocal about the field and really the things that are in the way. And there needs to be a shift in perspective uh, if academia is going to be the place where progress is made. I've left, right? I've left because I didn't want to deal with it. Um, but that said, I'm still doing open source work. I'm still releasing libraries. I haven't completely gotten out of this, uh, gotten out of everything. And I'm making free tools for academia too. So I'm going to be building over here for a while because progress is way faster this way. And uh, we'll see what happens. But I wanted to add, I wanted to add a little bit of the context and voice my thoughts on that at least. So if you're still here after that giant ramble, um, and you want to help out my work for free, there are two ways you can do that. Details will be in the description. You can follow my X and you can star Pufferlib. Stars help a lot, actually. They really do. Um, you can usually find me building all of these things live, not in the tuxedo, but uh, building these things live on YouTube, Twitch, uh, Twitter, yeah, slash X, whatever. And uh, you can also check out the Discord link will be in the description for that as well in chat. And uh, we're getting to the point where we actually have a nice community and people are building and contributing all sorts of different super ultra high performing environments to Puffer. Uh, I have another video coming out soon that'll be much more polished. You can look around for that one. It won't be as rambly as this, high production value. There'll be my thoughts on Puffer and its place in the field as a whole. Really a much more condensed version of what I was trying to do in this paper. Um, that's not limited even to as academic constraints as this, so look out for that. Uh, but that's all for now, so thank you for your interest.